Paul Lefevre, the Zojo Developer Evangelist. Uh, maybe you've heard of me. I'll be doing one or 30 sessions here this week. This session here is about Raspberry Pi, a fun little thing. And I've been told to say that this is a great segue from the blueberry cobbler that you had at lunch. Oh. And uh, if, if apologies to that. You can talk to Craig Boyd in the back if that, that really kind of hurt. But, uh, but there you go. <laughs> So I call it the ultimate gadget because uh, this little thing is kind of just an amazing thing. And uh, we're going to talk about it a bit. This will be good for people that ha really have no idea what it is, hasn't really seen one in action. And I've got a couple things here to show and a few little examples of some stuff that other customers have made using Raspberry Pi. So what is a Raspberry Pi? Well, it was introduced in 2012, so it's been out for a little while. To be honest, I hadn't actually really heard of these things until last year when we announced we were going to add Raspberry Pi support to Zojo. And I'm like, who's I better look into that? So they have a fun little uh, icon of a gigantic Raspberry. So it's a single board computer. So, you know, tiny, tiny little computer. It looks like that. You rarely see the single board because you'll probably have it wrapped up in something else. But that's what the board itself looks like. And we'll get into that a little more closely so you can see the parts. So it's pretty tiny. It's not, well, I'm looking at my laptop here. It's not that tiny. It's not that big either. But <laughs> so it's somewhere in between. And maybe the size of your hand, a little smaller. It's low power. So uh, the one I have here is just running off of a micro USB thing plugged to an outlet. But you can get batteries and run them off batteries, which is nice. Generally low cost. They start at about $35. That's pretty cheap for a full-blown computer. They are ARM-based. So it is a full-blown computer, but it's using the ARM uh, CPU chipset. The reason this now works with Zojo is because of the LLVM compiler. So you can kind of thank the, all the work for 64-bit as enabling the ability to create Raspberry Pi. And you might think, how on earth are those two things related? And they're related strictly by the LLVM compiler being able to target different platforms. And just in September, the Raspberry Pi Foundation announced that they've had over 10 million of these little things sold. Uh, that's across the various ones they make. This is a picture of a Raspberry Pi 2 that's up here, but they make a few other models as well. So what can you do with this thing? Well, really, you can do whatever you want with it. It's, it's a computer, but it's a computer that's tiny. So you can start to use it in places that a regular computer might not be appropriate for. It is a real computer. It runs Linux. It can actually run other operating systems as well. But if you're using it with Zojo and for most other things, you're going to be want to be running Linux on it. So you can run apps on it, regular old desktop apps, for example. You can run those just fine. Uh, it's great for hardware projects. That's probably its big claim to fame. It can be used for web servers. And if you're really curious and you've got a couple, three, four, six hours to spare, you can talk to Cam about using it as a VPN. Uh, he's, he did that last week, and he's, he loves talking about it, maybe even more than he loves talking about the Yankees. There are limitations with something that's this tiny, of course. You know, it's not the... You know, it's not going to solve every world problem. One of the big ones is it doesn't really have a hard disk. So it uses an SD card for storage. And those can vary in speed. You can get some that are pretty good, but they're never going to approach the speed of a true SSD or anything like that. So you have to keep that in mind for I.O. Uh, you may not want to be using this for like a database server or something like that. And the performance is probably going to be less than what you expect with a typical computer. It varies on the particular Pi. Uh, model that you're using, but in general, uh, it's ARM-based. It's not going to be super fast. It has a low amount of RAM, so it's going to limit you there. So you have to think about that from a uh, performance standpoint. So let's take a look at the Pi 2 and its hardware. This is a model I actually have. This model works with Zojo, as does uh, the Pi 3. We'll mention that here. So this is a, the bare board of a Pi 2. And you can see, you know, it looks like a computer board, I guess. So it's got different things on it. Right on the side there, there are four USB ports. So you can plug stuff into it. You can actually plug a keyboard into it, a mouse into it, using the USB ports. You can even plug in external drives, although you can't boot from them. It has 
and this is probably the biggest thing on the Pi, an Ethernet port. So you can plug it directly into Ethernet, get it on the network. It has a little AV output port here. This is like a, one of those little 1 8 inch headphone jacks. Uh, they were able to get a deal on them now because Apple doesn't use them anymore. Um, <laughs> and it, could also, it can output both audio and video, depending on settings. It also has an HDMI uh, port here. So you can actually get this thing, plug in a keyboard, a mouse, plug it into an HDMI television set, and you're rocking like it's 1984. You look like you have a Commodore and Atari hooked up to a TV set in your living room. I actually got a picture of my son doing that when I got my Pi. I hitched it all up in the living room, sat him on the floor in front of the thing. He was, it, came, it comes built in with Minecraft, and he was in seventh heaven playing with this in the floor. And it's pretty, pretty neat, a good nostalgia factor there. Has a power plug here, it's just micro USB, which is pretty neat, easy to get access to. On the side, you can't really see it on here because it's underneath the board is the micro SD card slot. And at the top are the GPIO, that's general purpose input output pins that are used to interface hardware to the Pi. In the middle here, there's a uh, dedicated connector for a camera, the Raspberry Foundation sells camera modules that can plug right into that thing that can be used for various purposes. And then the same thing with the display connector. You can actually get displays that connect directly to the Pi. And I believe Robin might correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this thing uses that connection. This here is a touchscreen display connected to a Raspberry Pi in a fancy case. This is Robin's thing. I'm very jealous of it. Uh, so, you know, block him on the way out and I'll make my escape. So where can you get one of these? Well, for use with Zojo, first of all, you've got to make sure you get the right one. There are, uh, I guess, four models of Raspberry Pi right now. There's the, uh, and they're numbered sequentially, but although they didn't come out sequentially. There's the Pi Zero, which is a tiny, tiny little one, um, like maybe a little bit bigger than a stick of gum size. It's literally small. But that one does not run the appropriate ARM CPU, so Zojo apps cannot run on it. The same with the Raspberry Pi 1. The Raspberry Pi 2 and the Raspberry Pi 3, however, are perfect for Zojo apps. Uh, they work great. The big difference between these two is the, they still sell them both, uh, oddly enough. Uh, the Pi 2 came up first, of course. It has slightly slower CPU speed. It does not come with built-in Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. Probably has a few other differences, but those are the most uh, notable to me. The Raspberry Pi has much faster CPU speed does generate a bit more heat, but also has built-in Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. So it's kind of like, depending on your application, you might want to choose which one you want because they sell them for the same price. I suspect one of these, the two probably will go away over time, but for now, it still seems to be available. Around here, Adafruit is probably the best place to check out for Pi stuff. They kind of focus on all these mobile little gadget things, got lots of kits and add-ons and all kinds of stuff. So that's a great place to start looking for stuff. Um, you can also check out a place called Kana Kit. This is where I got my Pi from these guys. They sell a kit. And uh, kits are great. It comes with the board. But it also comes with everything else you need to uh, you know, get the board running, so to speak. And the Pi may cost 35 bucks, but then you're just holding a circuit board in your hand and whoop de doo unless you're one of those Marvel superheroes that can power things with your hand. You're not very, not very well off. So, not that you can see it too much here, but this little black thing is the case from Kana Kit, and in there is the Raspberry Pi, and then it comes with also the power and an SD card and the Wi-Fi module if you need it for the appropriate Pi and stuff like that. So you kind of get everything you need all at once, and you don't have to hunt various websites looking for all the components to get your Pi operational. As I mentioned here, this. This is kind of, a, kind of all the, the stuff you get with a, with a Kana kit package. So kits are great. So you got your Pi. You want to start using how you set it up. Well, if you've got a kit, it probably came with an SD card, and it's going to have this thing on it called the Noobs Installer. And what you can do is you're just going to slide the SD card into the Pi, and you're going to uh, see what I got next here. Yeah, you can download that separately, too, for you want to. Uh, if you want to upgrade or anything like that. So you, you set it up on the SD card, and you're going to just boot the thing, essentially. 
you can plug it into a, a keyboard and a TV and you're going to boot. So let me get through a couple of the other things here. For setting up noobs, if you didn't buy a kit, you can use an app on Mac called Apple Pie Baker. The names, I just, I just don't know the names. They're, they're all talking to Craig about naming their stuff. It's weird. And then once you've got that card set up, and like I said, getting a kit, you don't have to worry about that because it comes pre-configured. You can connect your keyboard, your mouse, and your display, like I said, and uh, just boot the thing. And you'll get you know, a boot screen, and then you can pick from the list that you want Raspbian and Jesse Linux. And then you just kind of let it chug and do its thing. When I first set up my Pi 2, it probably took 15, maybe even 20 minutes, if I'm pretty sure, to install the operating system. So that's probably a little long, considering that this is a relatively lightweight version of Linux. But I mean, it is going on an SD card, so there you go. But you just let it install, you wait for it to finish. And speaking of Raspbian and Jesse, that is a version of Debian Linux, so, uh, which is a high quality version of Linux. <laughs> so that's what that is. And it is optimized for ARM and Pi. So you can see that's a little bit what it looks like, uh, the desktop. And I think that is a picture of the older, oh wait, that hasn't come up yet, sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. So it's optimized for ARM and Pi. So this is what it looks like, or did look like uh, up until a week ago. <laughs> of course, you know, the Raspbian folks pushed out a big update a week before my presentation without checking with me. I don't understand those people. So that's what it looked like a week ago. And then Raspbian Pixel came out last week. Um, if you follow the forums, Fred kindly posted a link to this, which actually made me realize it, because otherwise I probably would have noticed after I landed here. <laughs> Pixel did a nice job of cleaning up the desktop UI so it looks a lot slicker and less uh, old school Linuxy, so to speak. So it, it just looks a lot prettier, has a few more things built in, uh, which is pretty nice. And you can uh, read the blog post about Pixel if you want to learn more about it there. So once you have your Pi, how do you use or connect to the thing? Because you know, you're not going to want to leave it hooked up downstairs to your TV set with a keyboard hanging off of it, more than likely. This isn't 1984. And there are quite a few ways to connect to it. And you can tell by the small font for the first item. <laughs> <laughs> so, and see, and actually, this is, I didn't consider this, but I can't even read what's coming up next. The font is so small. <laughs> so, there we go. So, let's see here if I can fake it. All right, so SSH is secure shell for connecting to devices. That's built into the Pi. So as soon as the Pi boots up, regardless of whether it's connected to anything, display or keyboard or anything like that, SSH will be available. Um, this does, however, mean that it's going to need to be connected to a network in some manner. So what I did with my Pi is uh, I actually booted up with a keyboard and a desktop and a uh, keyboard, mouse, and display and made sure I configured it to auto-connect to my home Wi-Fi network. And then once I did that, I just shut the thing down, brought it up to my office, and it sits up there, not connected to anything anymore. And I can use SSH to connect to it. SSH built into the Pi, like I was saying, which is great. You just use a command like this from your terminal or, or whatever you have, SSH, Pi, at, and then the IP address. And that'll just prompt for a password. And you can see it connects text space. Again, staying old school here. And you're connected to your Pi. You can look at the file system, move stuff around, that sort of thing. The next thing you'll want to use is SFTP to copy files over to the Pi. This is also built in, which is great. And you're going to use it for copying files to and from the Pi. When you're building Zojo apps, this is the way you're going to get your Zojo app to the Pi in order to run it. So it's going to use SFTP. And any client works on, on the other side. I actually use a couple on my Mac. I, got, I think I use Forklift. I also have uh, another one that actually uh, sets up an F SFTP connection as a drive on the Mac, which is really handy. So then in Finder, I just have a window open. I can just drag stuff to it. So that's really handy. Interaki? Interaki? Yeah, I do not use Interaki, no. Chem 
Uh, yeah, Ken mentioned Interarchy. Yeah, the name of the tool that I use, I think they picked a bad name because I can never remember the name of it. But. You can also use SCP, so you don't need any special client. For secure copy, you move files back and forth. All right, Fred is noting you can also use SCP for secure copying to move files back and forth without having to go through this as well. I haven't tried that yet, so noted. Another thing you're going to want to use is screen sharing, so VNC screen sharing. And up until Pixel, you had to install this manually. Uh, Pixel now includes a VNC server, so you don't have to. So that's good. I already had it installed on my Pi because I've been using it for a year or so, and I had to install it manually. There are instructions for installing it manually right on the Raspberry Pi site. Um, and if you're using the newer Pixel version, that blog post notes uh, the command to start it. But this is the old command. You just have to, uh, well, this is the commands to install it and it installs the tight VNC server. The Pixel comes with the real VNC server. No relation to the old Zojo company. And yes, real uh, VNC with Pixel. And any VNC client works, I just use screen sharing on my Mac. Yes, Bruno? For the Mac, you can also install Metatox. It works very well, and you can just mount your home folder on your Mac. So Bruno is noting something called NetTalk? NetTalk. NetTalk that can also be used to connect to the Pi. Yeah, there's lots of stuff. I mean, it becomes a regular network accessible device, so you can connect to it lots of ways. And then when you're using VNC, you just provide the VNC command to whatever client you're using. So like I said, I use the built-in screen sharing. You know, you go to Finder and you pick go, uh, connect to server, or go to server, and you type this in and it comes up and you can see your screen. And those, uh, before I go into this, the screenshots I showed you earlier were both snapped from using uh, screen sharing. They weren't actual snapshots on the Pi. They're from the screen sharing. So programming the Pi with Zojo. Well, you can make pretty much any type of app you want to run on the Pi. It can run desktop apps. It can run web apps. And it can run console apps. Last year, at last year's XDC, when we announced Pi support, we, were, uh, we announced that only console apps were going to be available for Pi. That was our initial uh, commitment, as we hadn't uh, determined at that point how much work it would be to support all the targets. But it turned out as we were working through the release that it wasn't going to be a huge deal to flip on the switch for both desktop and web. So we were able to do that as well. So the initial release of Pi support supported all the targets, which is great. And to do this, you do it from the Linux build settings. So it's not like there's a new target that says Raspberry Pi. Raspberry Pi is essentially a different setting when you're building for Linux. So in the, uh, the build settings, there's a section there for, uh, I don't know what it says there, architecture, I guess. And you can choose x86, which is typically the default, or you can switch it to ARM 32-bit. And when you do that, you're essentially building a Pi app that you can then transfer over to the Pi, and it runs on the Pi. Said you build it and you copy it. So what are some limitations with using Zojo to make Raspberry Pi apps? Well, the big one that will be remedied soon is that there is no debugging for apps that are running on the Pi. You can't remote debug over to the Pi, so you can't actually debug. You have to, much like you know, the Pi itself seems a bit like a retro device, your debugging is going to have to go retro as well. So that means you know, message logs, printing, message boxes, or whatever you're comfortable with, your own logging, uh, stuff like that to uh, do any sort of debugging. Of course, Zojo itself also doesn't run on the Pi, so you, actually, you have to use a different uh, computer to, to do your development work. The HTML viewer is also uh, non-functional on the current version of Jesse. It works on the older version of Wheezy, but that seems less common right now. Uh, we're still trying to figure out what the problem here is with this. We've been looking into it for some time. Unfortunately, we haven't isolated, so it's still not yet working. But uh, I, I'm hopeful that we're going to be able to get that up and running, because HTML viewer would be a pretty cool thing. All right, some tips for using Zojo with the Raspberry Pi. It's a little bit of code here. By default, the Raspberry Pi wants to output its audio through the HDMI port. So if you, like me, are mostly running your Pi headless, but you maybe want to actually have it play some audio, you have to switch it to use that little AV port that they got for discount price from Apple. 
And you can do that by running a shell command on the Pi, and the syntax is there, and that switches it over to use the AV port for the output. I presume, yeah, the question is, are you using the HDMI port because the HDMI devices typically have built-in sound? And yeah, I would guess that's the case because people probably do hook these up to televisions and those always have built-in sound. So I guess that's just what they figure is easier and if you have more advanced uses, you can handle this command. <laughs> um, on the Pi, you can also check uh, which web browser is running. Uh, up until Pixel, the default Pi browser was something that kind of had the name Epiphany. It wasn't the official name they were going by, but it tended to vary. But that was the browser that it came with, and it was kind. this is the browser that runs on the Pi. So if you needed to check that someone was actually using the Pi and running the web browser on the Pi to access your web app, you could do that using this command. Starting with Pixel, they now include a version of Chromium for the Pi, which from all reports I've heard, I haven't had much of time to test it, is way better than Epiphany. It's the default. I believe Epiphany is still on there, but I can't imagine anyone is really going to want to use it anymore. But you can, you can check Chromium using the, the typical settings for a browser type that are already in Zojo. So let's talk a bit about the hardware aspect of the Raspberry Pi. A, that's where things start to differ a little bit from uh, working with any other computer or platform. So as I mentioned, GPIO is the general purpose input-output connection. And I will hold up something for you guys to all squint at. So you can see here I have my Pi, and it's got a ribbon cable coming out of it. This looks like a printer cable from 1982. Actually, it's a little smaller than one, I think. But where the printer cable is connected, or the, the cable is connected, that's connected to the GPIO port. And it's going out here to a breadboard, which we'll talk about in a bit. But that's how that is uh, connected up and used, typically. And to get access to that, we've created a GPIO library that's on GitHub. It's open source. Uh, this is a link here. And the GPIO library is a set of Zojo classes you can drag into your project. And it gives you access to a lot of the stuff on, uh, that you can do through the GPIO to make it a little easier for you so you can do stuff. It is based on the WiringPi C library. So it requires that wiring Pi be installed on your Pi. And on older versions, it, you had to install it manually. I believe you still have to install it manually. But that's pretty easy to do. And what does it support? Well, it, it gives you access to all the GPIO pins. So you can hook up things and you know, make it easier to read buttons. And these are like physical buttons that are sitting out that you can press. You can light up LEDs and do things with it. You can control servo motors to turn and move things. You can actually have the Pi play weird tones like a computer did from the 80s, beeps and boops and buzzes and alarms and stuff like that. You can hook up LED displays. You can hook up LCD character displays, like what is lit up here. And if you want to see this stuff more closely, See me after the session. I'm happy to show you all the crazy wiring. This was, uh, this was fun to get through TSA. Uh, took it all apart and stuff. But they actually didn't question me, which was, which was funny. But I had it all apart and in separate baggies and stuff. I don't know if that looked better or worse. But <laughs> The only concern was when I got here to wire it all back together, right? There's a lot of wires on here. But I did. It worked the first time. So I was pretty happy with that. So that gives you, the library gives you access to all kinds of stuff that you can wire up like that. And when you're using the GPIO, your apps and your console apps need to run at super user levels. So you either have to start them using the sudo command. And if they're a desktop uh, app, you'll have to use, I think it's GK sudo. I didn't note that in here, but that's in the documentation. Or on uh, current versions of Jesse, you can actually uh, set up this environment variable, wiring pi GPIO mem. And when you do that, you don't have to run it as sudo. It'll just run. So that, that's probably a lot handier, uh, something maybe you can add to a, a boot script on the Pi. So here we'll take a quick look at some code. So this is code using the GPIO library to uh, buzz, kind of like an alarm. 
so to speak. So you can see some of the code here. Uh, this is just a, uh, it's a namespace module. So you just call the setup GPIO method. And that essentially initializes everything, sets the pin numbers and all kinds of other stuff. Here I have a constant that is the pin number to which I've connected the little buzzer thing that would be on the board. And I tell it that I'm sending output to that pin. And then I'm just looping through 10 times and I'm turning, I'm doing a write, this is a digital write, out to that thing. And I'm essentially turning it on and off. So the buzzer is gonna go you know, high and low, which means it'll buzz and turn off. So it'll be some sort of weird alarm sound. The cats hated it. Uh, it's kind of high pitched. So that's a very simple example of how you can uh, wire up a little alarm buzzer. Uh, let's see here, buzzer tone. This is some C code that you can see. As often when you're doing Pi stuff, you may find things on the internet that you want to repurpose. And, but it, they'd probably be written in a different language. But the wiring Pi library is, and the GPIO library is very similar to stuff used by other tools and other languages, so you can easily translate things. So this here, you're looking at C code. I do apologize for that. Um, and this plays a little tune. I believe it's the Super Mario Brothers tune. And you can see what the C code looks like to do that. And then the corresponding Zojo code. Very, very similar. You know, just creating the array of the tones and then using one of the GPIO library methods to send those tones off to the little thing and it can play the little tune. Next, you've got an LED. Uh, these are little lights that everyone has seen. And you can, uh, this is an RGB LED actually, so it's multicolored thing. So you can see how this is configured as well. You have to set what the pins are for each of the colors and you can control them individually using the library. This particular code just loops through and picks some random numbers and changes the colors so that the LED kind of fluctuates through kind of funky colors. And this is some servo code that controls the servo. Uh, this code here just makes the servo kind of turn left and turn right and move. And all of these little demos are showing you how you can control these neat little gadgets that you can plug into your Pi, wire into your Pi. Obviously, by themselves, they don't do anything. <laughs> Other than you put a servo on your desk, you run this code, it kind of scoots all over the place till it falls off or drags your Pi off the desk or something. But very, very useful. But if, you, if you're a little more creative, just a little bit more, you can find practical uses for this sort of thing. Uh, I forget who was talking to me about, oh, it was, it was Mark Zeter. He was telling me, like, you know, he wants to maybe use a garage door opener. He's heard of people that use a servo going the old school way. They mount the old garage door opener on the somewhere. And he wants to have a garage door opener hooked to his phone. So you make the Pi app that maybe is a web app or something that's listening to this thing. But in the end, it's controlling a servo. It moves its little arm and it hits the button on the old remote to open the garage door. And that's the kind of weird stuff you can do with something like this. Uh, it'd probably be more reliable if you actually wired things in directly, of course, but you, you never know how you may want to use something like this. You could, I, I've toyed with maybe making a, uh, an automated cat feeder using a more powerful servo than I have, but you could set it on a timer so it kind of opens the door, some kitty food kibble comes out, and then it closes the door again, so stuff like that. LCD panel, this is what I just held up here in a moment. You can see some code here. This is an LCD panel, and not, not that any of you can read this, stop by the registration desk if you want, but this says here something like, uh, Zojo makes Raspberry Pi programming as easy as Pi. And it's scrolling, that message is scrolling. And you can see the code here. This is really nice that this is all encapsulated in the library for you, and I, Expect, you know, if anyone's using this, you know, checks can be made in large amounts because it took me a really long time to get this work. <laughs> and that was actually the, the Python code. I apologize, I forgot to mention that. This is what the Zojo code looks like. You see the Zojo code is actually a little more concise than the Python code, but very, very similar. So if you do find Python code out there that you want to repurpose, you can typically map it down to Zojo code without much trouble. All right, so that's an example of some code that talks to hardware. Well, how do you set up all this hardware? Well, you need 
something called a breadboard. A breadboard is this thing here that all the wires are plugged into. This is a largish breadboard. I actually had a smaller one that came with my kit that's about half that size, but the smaller one was, didn't have enough uh, holes in it for me to plug in all this stuff. So I needed to order a larger breadboard. And you can hitch up multiple breadboards together to make really crazy big wired things that look freaky. So you're gonna need a breadboard. You're gonna need something called a cobbler and you'll need wires, and then you'll need all the little things you want to hook up. These could be sensors, LEDs, buttons, potentiometers, servos, whatever else you want. Accessories, that sort of thing. So all kinds of hardware. So this is what a breadboard looks like. That's exciting. Uh, this is just a way to map those pins that are on the Pi, the GPIO pins out to make them easier to access and connect things to. A cobbler is a little gadget that this ribbon cable connects to, and it essentially takes all those pins out of the pie, reroutes them to the breadboard, again, so they're all labeled nicely, and you can easily plug in wires and see what you're doing, and more easily work with stuff. And when you connect it all together, you end up with something like this. You get the ribbon cable connected to the Pi board, which is connected to the cobbler, which is plugged into the breadboard, and then you have wires in the breadboard that are connected to various things. Yes? Could you, if you chose to, if you wanted to forego this extra equipment, solder directly onto the Pi motherboard? Kem is asking if you wanted to forego this stuff, if you, could, if you could just directly solder or detach things directly to the GPIO pins on the Pi. If you're crazy, you absolutely could, yes. Uh, uh, yeah, that, that can work. And certainly, the breadboard is great for testing and rewiring and easily moving things. Once you've got a design you know that works and you're really comfortable with it, and maybe you want to put it in something that's more portable or compact, it might make sense to then take your design and your circuits that you've all you know, carefully laid out and documented so you can get back to it, and then do it that way, because it'll take up less space. Is there connectors about the size of a jumper you can just put on a pair of pins if you want to do it that way? Yes, Tom is noting you can also use jumpers that can put on pins and stuff like that. So you can go that route, but if you're starting out or you're, you're working through a design that you're trying to figure out, I certainly would not try that. That'll just make your life more miserable. Yeah, Chuck. Yes, Chuck is also noting that you can buy daughter boards that essentially plug into the top of the pie, into the uh, pin thing, and then give you another place to work, so to speak. Uh, when, if you do go to that Adafruit site and you look around, uh, you'll be there for a while <laughs> as you see all kinds of things like, ooh, I want that, I want that. Oh, this $35 computer is costing me a lot of money. So uh, GPIO pin numbers, this, this came up on the forum, so I thought I'd show this little chart that came with my, my Kana kit that shows the pin numbers. Because it can be a little weird to understand how the pin numbers work. Uh, the GPIO pin numbering is the most common thing you're going to see used on uh, projects. It's the thing I use in all the documentation. It's pretty much the, the standard thing. And it's noted pretty well here. So that you can, if you can see those things, you can see the pins aren't numbered sequentially in any way. Uh, there's a pin there called 23 and 17, but there's not like a pin necessarily called 9 or anything like that. And so uh, this is on my desk all the time. <laughs> so I refer to it all the time. So feel free to use this and print it, I guess, if you need it. But the pin numbers are obviously important, because if you're finding a project on the internet that you maybe want to adapt to Zojo, it's going to tell you how to wire things up using specific pin numbers. And you know, if you mix up something, guess what? It doesn't work, uh, best case. Uh, worst case is you, you know, reverse polarity and did something awful and decided that that's going to melt your pie, and you don't want to do that either. So GPIO code, this here is a, well, I guess you can call it a circuit diagram, not that I'm any sort of electrical engineer, so it's probably a really bad circuit diagram. But this is a diagram for how a LED might be uh, wired up to the pie on a breadboard. So you can see there that little red thing, that's the LED. And there's a wire that's coming off the cobbler down to the LED, that's one of the pin numbers. I think it says pin number four, probably. And then on the other end of the LED, there's a resistor. I 
That's what that little squiggly thing is, according to me. And that's connected over to the ground line of the breadboard. And the ground line is then also connected back to the cobbler to a ground pin. There are multiple ground pins on the cobbler, so uh, it doesn't really matter which one you choose. And I could have directly connected that other end of the resistor directly to the ground pin on the pie, but that little, those, that channel that's on the right, all breadboards have them, and they're the ground and the power channels. And you want to generally connect something to that so you can easily access ground and power elsewhere on your board without having to use lots of long wires that crisscross each other and then you know, end up with something that's even scarier than these wires. And then corresponding code for something like that looks like this. And the end result when you have that program and you, you run, uh, you get a little, this is really exciting, believe me, first time you get this working when you've got your first pie, it's, it's pretty thrilling, especially if you're not really a, a handy hardware electrical guy like I am, and you're like, ooh, I made something blink. It's pretty amazing. But, you know, baby steps, right? So again, what are some uses of this? Hardware projects, uh, message panel, uh, kind of what I show here, I'm just showing a scrolling message, but this could obviously be used to do all kinds of cool stuff. Um, I could have it uh, maybe show the IP address of the Pi when it boots. I could have it show email message that come in if I had the Pi running an app that was listening to my mail server. I, I could have it show notifications on this. You know, whatever I wanted, I now have access to a message panel that I can write to. Uh, so uh, we'll take a look at uh, that specific code that's making this scrolling thing work. You can also, of course, run a web server on the Pi. And I made a little rinky-dink web server um, that runs on the Pi uh, that it allows my kids to bring up an app, well, not really an app, but a you know, button on their home page that shows what their current allowance balances are. Because they're always asking me about that. I got a little app on my phone that I you know, track that each week. You know, What's my allowance now, Dad? So now I can just put that up on the web and they can go there and check it. It's a, it's a rinky-dink app. It doesn't do anything. It has a little screen with a number that shows. But it's, it's a little bit useful. Uh, you can also have uh, other apps. I'll have a, I have an app that uh, is called Cats Up. Uh, this is actually in the App Store as well. It shows cat pictures. <laughs> and... Uh, but I've made it as a Raspberry Pi app, so if you hitch it up to your TV set, it kind of runs as a super fancy screensaver, and it shows cat pictures up on the screen. And, you know, everybody seems to love cat pictures. And I also got a little game that I've made. My son and I made this when I first got the, the Pi, and it's called Find Seltzer, and it's a text adventure. You know, the good old days, go north, look at table, <laughs> uh, that sort of stuff. So that, that was the first thing I made on the Pi, actually. So let's take a look at the message panel. I've been holding it up a little bit here, but it's obviously it's pretty small to see. So I get a kind of a zoomed in photo. And you can see, I mean, look at those wires. Uh, this, you know, I am no Pi wiring hardware expert. This is, the, this is the most difficult thing I've wired up on the Pi. And it took me, because I was doing the library at the same time and figuring out the wiring, it took me a really long time to get this working, an embarrassingly long amount of time. The stuff I was getting to show up on that LCD panel before I got this working was amazingly weird. Gibberish and characters, it just looked crazy. And, but it's fun when you're researching this stuff because it gets pretty low level. To send data to a message panel, if you're doing this manually without the library, you can't even send bytes to it. You've got to send the nibbles. So it's split into four. And you've got to take an ASCII character, divide it in half, send the first half, the high half, or the low half. I forget the order now. Uh, otherwise, you get gibberish on this thing. So uh, if, you know, if you like that, then you're like, ooh, exciting. Yeah, otherwise, use the library. <laughs> and you can see this is what the code is that is showing that particular message here. And it, there's an uh, LCD class in the library that kind of, like I was saying, hides all this from you. So you don't have to do anything but clear home, set the message, and then you can loop through and call other things. Uh, scroll is one of the method, methods that's available and do that. And when you do that, it looks like this. And I think that, whoop, did that not play? Sorry, I thought that was going to play a little video there. Maybe it doesn't. I guess it doesn't. Oh, it did? 
All right, I'm sorry. I'm blind, you know. Have I mentioned that? <laughs> so uh, this is a little uh, allowances app that I made. And you can see this is a ridiculously simple web app. You know, just a list box, a few text fields. And there's an admin panel. So if I uh, put in a hashtag at the top, it'll switch over to the admin panel. I didn't tell the kids the hashtag, because then they could go there and change their allowance amounts. <laughs> but I just. <laughs> The security is not the best in this app, but you know, it, it, it is home only, so. Uh, but they can fire this up on the phone and they can quickly see that. And I also, the list box has a little list of the chores they're supposed to remember to do in order to actually get the allowance. So little things like that, that's kind of fun. Uh, the Cats Up app uh, just displays cat pictures on TV, like I said, so you get you know, a full screen. This is, uh, these are screen caps from uh, me um, using the VNC viewer to get in there as opposed to my actual TV set. But you can see you get cat pictures. And like I said, everyone likes uh, looking at cat pictures, of course. Finding Seltzer the Cat. This, my son and I made this text adventure. Um, uh, it was a text adventure to find our cat Seltzer. Unfortunately, poor Seltzer passed away a couple weeks ago. So I had to put his picture in here. And my son was very upset. But we made a text adventure, and he's now immortalized. So that's great. And you get, I mean, this is as old school as you get, right? It's like an Infocom text adventure, uh, text adventure although my parser is awful. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't spend a lot of time on the parser. But you can do, th I, essentially, I made a text adventure that has in it a, all the rooms align with the rooms of our house. And so you can go in the front door, you can go north into the dining area, turn into the kitchen, go up the stairs to the second floor, go into each of the bedrooms. And the idea is in each of those rooms, there's something that you want to inspect to see if the cat is hiding underneath it. And, and it counts how many steps it took you. So it's, it's a, my son thought that was the coolest thing. So those are my little silly things I did. Now I'm going to show you a few more serious things that more serious people have made using uh, Raspberry Pi. So we have here a geothermal heat pump. And I got this example from a forum member, Matthias Sandstrom. And he, uh, see you get a picture up here, is using a Raspberry Pi to control a geothermal heat pump. This is a, a class project that he was doing that had a lab. And so you can see a heat pump I don't know what a heat pump is, but it sounds really sophisticated, right? But it got a tiny little pie controlling and tracking and monitoring the stats on this thing. And he made a, a corresponding web app that the students in the class use on their iPads to read the data from the heat pump and do whatever it is they're doing and learning there. And all that using a Zojo web app running on a Raspberry Pi. So that's a, that's a pretty neat real world use of you know, one of these tiny computers, what it can do for you. Yeah, as I mentioned there. Uh, another uh, thing that I, uh, Raspberry Pi is being used for is home automation. So there's a product out there called Moodifier. And it does home automation and lighting control. And the daemon that controls this, this uh, is actually written in Zojo. It's a Zojo web app. And it allows you to control a variety of things on the Pi. And because it's a daemon, it runs on the Pi, so it's just a headless thing. And it uh, lets you control lighting and you know, heat and cooling and all that sort of stuff that uh, you can have with your home. And let's see here. The next thing is uh, Bob Keeney, in his fun times, has created uh, or use a Raspberry Pi to control an electric kiln. And uh, this is a, an impressive thing as well. Uh, so he's got uh, notes, from, and, uh, notes from Bob include these, they're using Raspberry Pi 2 and a touch screen to control this. And a touch screen is similar to the one here that uh, Robin has. And he has to drive all kinds of relays and other things to control the temperatures. He has threads in there that are tracking things. Because of the way a kiln works, at least based on my understanding of what Bob told me that I'm now repeating to you probably incorrectly, is that the temperature can only move up and down you know, at a certain speed. You can't just crank it up. So it's got to track that temperature and see if it's adjusting it. And there's time limits for how quickly it can move and stuff like that. So a uh, pretty neat thing that uh, 
he has running on the Pi. That's uh, kind of what his little uh, desktop app looks like that's running on the touch screen. So that's pretty darn neat. So resources for Raspberry Pi. Uh, there's a lot of stuff out there because people use this for all kinds of things. Probably the best one to start with is the free Magpi magazine. You can get that in digital form right from the Raspberry Pi Foundation's website. You go to Magpi, they, they've, I think they just published issue 50, if that rings a bell. Uh, so they've been doing that for a while. Lots of project ideas and examples and things are in there. You can also actually subscribe and get an old school physical paper magazine so you can truly relive the 80s. On the Zoja website, of course, there are lots of hardware tutorials. Um, pretty much all the ones I showed you here are on the Dev Center with step-by-step -step instructions for how to do the wiring with circuit diagrams, so you can refer to those as well. So if you're just starting out, practicing with a few of these example things to get a feel for how to plug stuff in, what to do when you plug stuff in wrong, how to troubleshoot, it's great to start with simpler projects before you dive into something uh, too difficult. Um, Bjorn at Einhuger has also created a bunch of even more sophisticated tutorials. Uh, and he's using a lot of uh, motion gadgets and sensors to check, uh, you know, whatever those things test. So flame or temperature and sound. And those are the type of things that are available. So you can build a heat sensor. It'll put a heat sensor on there, wire it up, and then you can have a Zojo app that's checking uh, the temperature. And his tutorials are all online. And... So before I open it up to questions, I also wanted to point out that Zojo apps work on the Raspberry Pi, of course, but there's lots of other little gadgets that are coming down the pike that can also run these, that run Zojo apps. Um, pretty much as long as you're able to get uh, Raspbian Linux up on it. Um, someone earlier today was telling me about the Orange Pi, which is a Pi-like gadget, a little bit smaller, has Wi-Fi built in. I think it has a bit less RAM but it's cheaper. I think uh, you mentioned you've got to get it from China right now, but it can run it. Uh, Travis, if he's in here, has ordered something called a pocket chip, which is also another thing that's even smaller than the Pi, and you can get that in a, in a case, actually, that looks like a Game Boy with a keyboard and is running Linux in a command line mode. It's a weird little thing, but again, it's a, a cheap thing, and that can still run uh, Zojo app. So, as long as it essentially is an ARM machine running the right level CPU with Raspbian Linux, you'll likely be able to get his Ojo app running on it. So, any questions about this in general? Yeah? Did you play any, or do you, how much do you know about uh, how you can interface with the USB port in terms of hooking gadgets by USB? So the question is, hooking gadgets using, through USB, how much control do you have with that? Well, the Zojo serial classes are available on the Pi the same as they are on other things. So I haven't really played with any USB type gadgets, but I suspect it's going to work the same as it would with any USB gadget that's plugged into a Mac or a Windows computer. Yeah, that's my hope. I have a USB uh, barcode reader. It's got a USB barcode reader. Yeah, I would expect that would work the same as, you know, I, I would expect you design that thing and run it on Windows or Mac and then just check the box and run it on the Pi and you're good. Yeah, that's, that's how I would expect. Yeah. Well, I, I need one serial. Uh, I don't like work. Yeah, so there's a lot of different types of those. Um, any other comments, questions? Yes, Mark? So any idea, let's say if you're running Wi-Fi, what kind of light would you get with battery? Like, like, so... So the Pi, how long does it run on a battery? Well, I mean, obviously that's going to depend on the size and weight of the battery you want to hitch up to this thing. I have not attempted to run my Pi on a battery yet. I know that there are tons of options for that. Adafruit sells some that you can plug into it. I, I mean, it's, it's only hours, it's not days, unless you've got like, you know, several car batteries probably. But uh, I mean, it's low power compared to a computer, but it's not, you know. All right, so Rick here says 15,000 milliamp. He's getting eight hours with a lot of add-ons powered up, so that's pretty good. And, and, the fan to keep it cool, and he's got a fan on it, so eight hours seems like that's a pretty good yeah. amount. Yeah. 
Anything else? Uh, all right. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>